The Book of Recollections, Episode 14, Transgression, by Dysylvania. Last recollection ended with one big mother beeping cliffhanger. Prince Emmerich out of the picture in the utmost shockingly stupid headbutt. But who am I to judge people's life or death choices? Good or bad, this left me wondering what comes next. And now is the time to find out. I am your one and only book of recollections and here's what's been happening. With one of Jaimarita's hearts in Prince Philip's possession, Lena and Evander, alongside with their retinues, discuss how to go about obtaining theirs. One possibility was to bed the hag. But, in Evander's point of view, if he were the one to do it, this would pave the way to a catastrophic end for Greenspring due to his bloodline. The child would have rights to the throne. Proving trust and loyalty in the bonds created between our protagonists, the half-elf told Leo that he would not force him nor try to sway his mind towards doing something he did not want to. An approach which Lena could not take due to the fact that Arches was the only remaining member of her retinue. As Evander sent Castiel a message, telling him that his skills were needed, Thedion, Joymaritza's Hexling son, tried to comfort Philip, who was still shaken by his brother's death, causing the hag to bewitch the young prince into forgetting the event. As Thadion tried to explain what happened to Emmerich, he too fell victim to his mother's mind-altering spell and the two children turned their attention towards Stella, Philip's pony. Full of glee, Thadion revealed that he too had won, and, as kids are prone to do, they left the grown-ups to their boring discussions and went to play. Castiel and Grace were hastily making their way towards Joy Marita's home and, after reading Evander's message, the man tried to understand its meaning, asking if Grace had any idea what it might mean. Although she had some notion of the skills Evander talked about, due to the stories and legends she heard of, Grace decided to keep the man in the dark for a bit longer, not out of malice, but as an act of mercy. As the two arrived, Thadion, upon seeing Castiel, dashed towards him, telling the man that he recognized him from the time he was hanging whilst watching the mares. Castiel, being Castiel, was appalled by the Hexling's presence, calling him and his family creatures. However, that didn't seem to affect the youngling, whose nostrils picked up a strange smell from the two. Upon seeing them, the hag began to chastise the two, calling Castiel an aberration and Grace a sin, her indignation almost sparking a conflict between the two groups were it not for Evander's silver tongue. The group had some back and forth discussing the bedding of the hag. An agreement was reached by the two parties. Although the hag was appalled by the notion of bedding the man, her mind was swayed after he revealed that he could offer her not only the opportunity of seeing what the spawn of an aberration and the hag might look like, but also the most valuable gift in existence, seeing how he had no prior experience. The agreed-upon course of action stipulated that, if Castiel helped give birth to a daughter, he would be allowed to spend 16 years with her and the hag, at the end of which he would be able to take her out of Joy Maritza's domain for 10 days. After that, if she wanted to remain in Greenspring with her father, she could. After they had settled on these terms, Castiel required a bit of time, urging Genevieve to accompany him. As the two left the earshot of the group, he opened up the gen, revealing that he didn't want his first kiss to be with Joy Marita, and asked the Dampir if she could do him the honor, to which Jen accepted. After the two shared a quick kiss, Castiel asked if he could be left alone for a moment and began praying. Light was shed on what type of individual Castiel was, as he prayed to Saturnai to avoid her gaze from his unborn child for as long as possible, and Jovis to bless his offspring with the most powerful and pure gifts. No matter what she or he might be, no matter the assumptions and biases of the people, his child would always be loved. A prayer to which Jovis answered. Before heading into the massive tree, Castiel asked if Leo might accompany him and lend his melodic skills in order to make the experience a bit better. As the three entered the hag's chambers, their shared experience formed an unbreakable bond between the man and the drow. No, I will not go into detail about the beautiful 
and totally natural thing that happened before the child was born. But what I can tell you is that what Leo witnessed was enough to break his mind and throw him to the mouth of madness. And that it took Cassiel 10 years before Joy Marita finally got pregnant. Although the 26 years that Cassiel and Leo spent in the confines of the tree were hard, they were also wonderful, for they had a chance not many people got as they showered her, the Hexling Hag, with love. The offspring resembled both her mother's lineage and her father's, as her horns were bonny and her hands were skeletal. The unbreakable tie between Kerr and Castiel was apparent as the four made their way outside, walking hand in hand. The group saw that Castiel was now almost 50 years old, but despite that, he felt peaceful, while Leo still retained a bit of his thousand-yard stare. Thadion, the youngest child of Jemarita, spent no time in showing his enthusiasm and joy at not only having another sister whose appearance was so outlandish, but at the prospect of finally having a younger sibling, although both Kerr and Thadion were the same age. But the relative peace of the scene took a sharp turn as Joy Marita, upon being confronted with the fact that she now had to let Kerr go with Castiel, told everyone that they would have this privilege only if they proved worthy, which caused Corvesa and Amarantha to join her mother's side, and thus combat erupted. The battle was fierce. Evander, who, although proved himself extremely hard to hit, was downed by an onslaught from the combined might of the Covenant. Grace, who, although was rendered immobile by the witchcraft of their assailants, managed to stabilize the half-elf form via Mooney. Thadion, wanting to help the group and leave his home with his younger sister, tried to hinder his mother, but only managed to disappoint her and, after being hit by a tree sentinel, he assaulted Genevieve and downed Leo. Castiel got turned into a rat and was able to return to his form only after Arches joined the fray and the combined might of the man, Genevieve and Evander, who focused their attention towards harming Amarantha, were the ones to bring Joy Marita to heal, as damage caused to the offspring would result in damage to the mother. Joy Marita was displeased at the outcome of the battle, but allowed the group to depart with Kerr. That made Castiel have a private conversation with the hag, which warmed her heart. By displaying appreciation and respect towards the hag, in return, she offered to wind back Castiel's clock, turning him young again, to which the man accepted only after disclosing that he would like to keep six of those years. Before returning to the group, Joy Marita told Castiel that, no matter what Kerr was, the love she felt for her was impossible to put into words, and she thanked him for offering their child that which was eluded her other kids, the love of their fathers and the possibility of being loved by others. After enough consideration, Archis accepted to beg the hag and gave birth to what Joy Marita called the most beautiful hag in existence. Archis' display allowed Lena to take Corvesa as her desired heart, and, achieving their goal, our protagonists left for Greenspring. Before reaching the city, the group took some time to rest, during which many conversations were had and many points of view shared. But two important revelations were brought to light. The first was Genevieve, who received a letter from Mr. Fang, telling her that her father was not well and how a carriage would wait for her that night to take her to Nocturna Obscura. Distraught, she disclosed this to Leo, who accepted her indirect invitation to join her. The second came in the form of an eviction notice aimed at Castiel, following investigations of his shop and the illegal nature of his trade. The eviction notice was signed by Lady Cora, with whom Evander had an on-again, off-again relationship. Evander took it upon himself to investigate the matter further after the trial was announced. Because Castiel and his family were virtually homeless, Leo and Jen told the group that they would leave for Nocturna Obscura and that the doors of the Chancellor's Mansion would always be open to everyone. The group was grateful and Castiel assured the Chancellor that he will keep a close eye on his parents. The streets of Greenspring were filled with people showing all manner of feelings towards the Hexlings, which didn't help the anxiety they felt. Not only was that the first time they left the forest, but it was also the first time they had seen so many people. 
At the very top of the stairs that led into the palace stood the astrals who invited the competitors to present the hearts. With the usual pizzazz and flair for the dramatic, Jovis took Thedion and Corvessa and made a show of presenting them, but, upon gazing at Kerr, they fell silent. Saturni began to hectically sign towards Castiel. Jovis, although appalled by Kerr, allowed Evander to succeed in his trial due to their connection. This granted Kerr to be welcome into the palace the same way her siblings were. Although tensions began to die down, the regent queen, upon hearing from Philip that his brother went missing, turned to the astrals and chose Marthas to announce the final trial, which would dictate who would become the next Meritronarch. His words spoke of the trial taking place on his day, and that death would follow and royal blood would be spilled. As soon as the people heard these words, they left for their homes, as a feeling of displeasure and dread lingered in the air. Inside the palace, just as soon as Kerr came, Thedion became worried for both his sisters. He asked them how they felt, and, sensing the same unease, he gave them a trinket each, which would ensure that, no matter where they were, they could talk to one another. He told them that, if anything would happen to either of them, they would kill everyone, stressing the fact that they had to watch each other's backs. With the three Hexlings agreeing, the story continues outside of the building as our protagonists engage in discussions with Jovis. They discover that the Astrals wish to sacrifice the Hexlings in order to follow the protocols of the trials. This displeased Evander terribly, but he still managed to control his anger. Castiel could not, wanting to understand why the Hexlings and his daughter were viewed as the most dangerous beings in the eyes of the Astrals. The answer was less than satisfactory, seeing how it referred to things that the Hexlings might do in the future, either in wanting to please Evander or simply wanting to let fate play out. Jovis allowed the half-elf to take the Hexlings outside the confines of the palace, turning a blind eye. Meanwhile, Prince Philip levitated Thadion's chamber and invited him to play in the garden. At the exact same time, Genevieve climbed the walls and took Kerr to Castiel before heading back inside to take away Amarantha. The fates deemed it worthy for these happenings to take a turn when one of the guards saw Jen and raised the alarm, which resulted in him being knocked out and the damper changing herself into a female version of Leo and bringing Amarantha back to the group before herself and the half-elf left for the gourmet fang. However, Prince Philip and Thadion were seen by the Astrals and the young contender told them that the Hexling would be part of his retinue. A few moments of tension followed, but Marthas simply stared at them smiling. He then raised an approving finger. After a few hours of playing outside, Philip invited his new friend alongside the two ponies to his chamber, where they quickly fell asleep. Castiel and Kerr left for his home where they met Timmy and the old man standing outside with their luggage. Castiel went into the shop to retrieve his belongings and encountered Saturni. Following a fiery argument between the two, he was deemed forsaken by the Astral. As his former patron left, Castiel felt his magical abilities disappear as he took off the bandages of his right hand and began to talk to it. After placing the necklace which bore Saturni's symbol on the table, the skeletal hand on its own accord smashed it into pieces, showcasing Castiel's turn from the astrals. As Kerr entered the room, she took her father by the skeletal hand which gripped her tight but did not harm her. That caused the man to tell his daughter that she should never grab him by that hand for it was meant for his enemies to which Kerr replied that she knew that already for she had too. Evander made his way to Lady Cora, trying to sway her decision of evicting Castiel and also trying to understand whose side she was on. She told Evander that her decision had nothing to do with him and that she deserved to be the next queen. No matter how much Evander tried to explain to her that if he would be king, he would take no wife and would do anything in his power to change the old ways, she would not budge. Not even after Evander told her that he will make her his seneschal, virtually making her the second most powerful individual in Greenspring. With no agreements being made, Evander left, telling her that no matter the outcome, if he would become king, the offer would remain standing. 
Within the Auxilium Mansion, Grace and Castiel, at the human's discretion, began to translate the book given by Monkey, which bore the title, The Chronicles of the Immortal. Although their progress was interrupted by Evander, they had managed to decrypt some of the information which spoke about the Fortress of Death and some kind of power held within its walls, alongside a ritual which allowed someone to call forth an ethereal creature. Before going to bed, the three spent some time together discussing the situation involving Lady Cora and the best way to go about it. Although Castiel left for his chamber, Evander asked Grace if he might be able to spend some time alone with her. Inside her chamber, the half-elf professed his love to the woman alongside his promise that no matter what she was, he would still love her. This offered Grace the chance to finally reveal her true nature. As the magical facade fell, Evander saw Grace's skin, hair and eyes turn pure white. The sight caused Evander's mind to think back on the events of an outbreak that happened some years ago, which saw kids being born white and featureless, and, therefore, stigmatized as bad omens. Still, that did not deter the half-elf. As the two shared a passionate kiss, the hand of the fate shifted towards Leo and Genevieve, who embarked on the carriage that waited for them in front of Le Coq Gourmand restaurant. On the way, the two opened up to each other and engaged in conversation until the carriage suddenly stopped. And, outside, they saw Mr. Fang, Genevieve's employer, whom she never had the pleasure of meeting face to face. As Jen got out of the carriage and engaged in conversation, she was surprised to find out that the man was her grandfather. This revelation was followed by another, as her grandmother, which she encountered within the Lafevre crypt, pounced from the darkness and devoured every drop of blood from their carriage driver. Although the dampier was still thirsty, Jen managed to keep her away from Leo, and the four began to discuss matters of faith and the Lafevre family future, focusing on the only way in which Jen's father could be saved from dying of old age. After being invited to their castle, the two vampires disclosed that Mr. Fang was turned by Jen's grandmother and offered Leo the chance to become one of their own. In turn, they would offer him the means of healing his parents' insanity. Because it was a decision that could not be taken lightly, they allowed the Chancellor some time to think it over. They began their journey to the castle. Leo and Jen were both preoccupied by the group's whereabouts, and, because a few days had passed with almost no news, their worry for Adam and Kate grew stronger. This was the recap for episode 14 of Vim, as told by the Book of Recollections. I was Ruxandra Vorotnak, your Vim recap narrator. If you'd like to join us as Vim The Tale of Immortality premieres, tune in on Sunday at 5pm UTC on youtube.com slash New recaps drop every Friday evening. And remember, every subscribe keeps the magic alive. Thanks for sticking with us. Good day, good night, and don't let the vampires bite.